Thank you very much. It's not the quantity, but it's the quality that matters here. Now, I probably give talks once a week and have done for many years now. So my name's Lana Purcell and I was a commercial caterer down here in the Ocean Grove. I actually had the dream to take over all the school canteens back in 2014. And I opened Whole Foods canteens. So we made our muffins and we made our bread and we made everything from scratch. Now that was amazing, but financially not sustainable. I couldn't open clean canteens. We ran six in different schools and it was well loved, but kids are coming with 50 cents and a dollar. And you know we can't make food with real ingredients for that kind of price. So that actually led me into catering and I bought a catering business. I've always been a foodie. When I was 16, I used to follow Jamie Oliver around um, in London where I was living and see what he took off the shelves. I've done that for years. I'm obsessed with that man. Um, it's sad, like he should have married me. Like, I, I don't know what happened. He just kept looking at that weird girl that was always around him. Um, so catering then came on. I took on a, a contract, which was the Blues Train, which is an event down here on the, on the Bellarine at Queenscliff, which was 200 people every Friday night serving dinner. Um, on top of that was corporate catering and weddings and events and et cetera, et cetera. So I was thrown into an incredibly high stress, crazy uh, catering business. And we had leftovers. We always had leftovers. 2016, it sparked that I needed to get this food to somewhere else. And we used to do Save Our Salad on Sundays, which was for a donation, you could come and pick up some of the salad that we have left over. I had no idea that I would then, a few years down the track, turn into the fourth largest food rescue and food relief organisation in Australia. And that's what we're actually running. Um, Feed Me Bellarine was established in 2019. My chef and I were working our asses off and to be vulnerable in what we were doing. We worked too hard. We were both incredibly mentally not well. We were disregarding our, our actual health, our mental health, our families, our lives, and my chef pulled me out of a suicide attempt. I pulled my chef out of a suicide attempt and we decided that we can't work like this for other people anymore. We had to work like this for people. So we became passionate about taking our leftovers and one night social media we said, we've got meals available for the community. You don't have to tell us your problem. You don't have to tell us your story. If you want food tonight, come and get it. 50 people showed up that night at a church um, that was, you know, out of the way. No questions, there's your dinner, take it home. From that night, we then got messages day after day after day of children that were hungry, people that hadn't eaten for a few days, and we live in the most beautiful place, and everyone's so happy, and everyone and you come down here and you holiday. And we popped that bubble really, 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 really hard and showed the community that we're not okay. Uh, someone like me that's a local businesswoman with three kids driving a nice car was not okay. I wouldn't be here. Um, and I'm vulnerable with that story. I was a highly functioning alcoholic. I was drinking two bottles of wine a night, working a catering job. Um, showing up the next day, doing it again and again and again, trying to make it, and I couldn't make it. Um, and so we tell these stories about our situations. I've been sober for four years. Um, to show people that it's okay to ask for help and we're not gonna judge you on what your story is. So all this food started to make a real difference to people. We would do our job, get in a car, travel around, the Bellarine, and we delivered to 20 families, then 30, then 40, then 50, then 100, 200, 600, 900. We're sitting at 2,000 families a week that we're delivering meals to. The meals are made with food that everyone throws out. 
And if you were at dinner last night or the night before, that is all food that people have thrown out. We do not buy one single item for any meal that we make, and we make 8,000 meals a week in our kitchen. Um, our biggest rescue is bread. Bread is something I dream of, but my dreams are completely different to your dreams. Absolutely drowning in it, hate it, can't stand it, can't believe the policies around it, can't, can't believe procedures around it, just the waste of bread, and I'm sure Matt Preston probably said the same thing about bread, is the bane of my existence. Because last night when I went back to the shed, there was 100 kilos sitting there at the door that we'd picked up from one bakery. Um, we then play with it. There's so many things you can do with bread. We rip out the insides and we mold it back down into a dough and we fill it with jam and we deep fry it. We do anything that we possibly can with what we've got. So our chefs are using custard powder to thicken soups. They're using seasonings that you've never thought of to make something else. We're turning things into things that no one could imagine before and we're feeding kids and, and families here with the food that was everybody else's waste. We rescue 20 to 25 ton a week. Um, that then is then converted into those meals. But then our charity grew from the two of us to 60, 80, 100. We're at 538 volunteers now in the community that all have the same passion for rescuing food. But the main thing is the connection that food has just with your community and people. It's the one thing you can share. Um, and so our charity is a no questions, no agenda charity. We accept anyone with any situation or anything. You don't have to prove you're, you're um, in need. And what we did is we built our shed to welcome people from all of the community. So you don't actually see us as a soup kitchen here. So you can come in. We've set a cafe up and a wasted market. So we're making wasted food available for the community to also purchase or take if they need to. So sometimes you might see a BMW show up at our shed. But they've gone in and they've gotten all the oranges that we rescue that we couldn't do anything with. And they've paid us $100 for them to keep us going. We received no community, no, no government funding. We received no council funding and it costs us $60,000 a month to run. So we opened up those channels so that the community could support us, but also we could give anonymity to people that were needing help that didn't want to be highlighted as a family that needs help. So when they bring their kids into the shop, they're not capturing memories of standing outside a church or a, a soup kitchen or anything like that, but they're getting that service in a different situation. So the memories for those children are going to be beautiful and good. Um, uh, as I came here today, there was two older ladies, and one of them hasn't been to a coffee shop for eight years because she can't afford to have a coffee with her friends. Um, they're living on a pension, and their medical bills are too high, and they don't go out. And they were crying because they had celery and a melon, and they sat and had a coffee. And you just don't realise just how much that means to someone. Um, so that, right now we're sitting with servicing 10,000 people a week in some capacity um, without purchasing one single item, uh, converting that food in the best possible way that we can. So we do the catering events like we did last night because we have very low cost involved. Um, we might have hired some plates, but the food didn't cost us anything, but every single dollar that goes to that service goes to support our charity because we can't rely on our government. We'll do the job for them, but they won't help us do the job. Um, so that's pretty much where we are and what we, we do and, and how we do it. But if anyone has any questions about how we work or... Yes, Danny. Um, I know, like, amazing. So inspiring. What are some of the policies you mentioned around bread that you um, aren't a fan of? Yeah, so Baker's Delight, um, they have a policy that you need to offer the client the array of food at the end of the day as if they were there at six o'clock in the morning. So they have the requirement to stock 
the front cabinet and the shelves in the, in the most beautiful way, which means that they then factor that into their baking so that um, they know they're going to give us seven trolleys of bread at the end of the day, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Disgusting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, Mick. I um, just, I thought you got government funding. No. I don't know how you do it. Yeah. Just. I talk to people. I show people. It's the community. The community supports us. Yeah. Yeah. The community supports us. So, a guy that was washing his car one day. There's there's money. People. Some people have a lot of money. <laughs> Um, he was washing his car and he came in and I showed him around. When you come into the site, we've got three sites now, you can feel how much of a difference that we're making for people. Um, committed $50,000 a year to us every year from his bank account. So um, we work really hard to work with other community organisations as well to, to get the things that we need. Um, but our day-to-day -day operations, we've got to work hard for our money to keep us going. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's it like, like you mentioned your, you were in a pretty bad place personally. What's it been like for you as a person to be doing this work? It's kept me alive. Um, it's given me the, like I really do work for purpose now. Um, I don't have to try so hard to do the right thing because I'm just, I am the right thing. I'm doing the right thing and I've attracted a crowd of people that are just completely empathetic and vulnerable in their own stories as well. So we're just really open with everyone and I now have a family that I didn't have before. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure I'm ADHD or something. Like I don't stop like two o'clock in the morning last night, Melbourne market that's where we go and get stuff and come back and do it all again. And I've worked every single day since uh, September 2019, every single day since then. We worked all through COVID because every other food relief agency closed their doors um, and we didn't because that is the time that we could actually stay connected to the community, we could feed the community and we went to their houses. So every other agency you had to come and get food from them we could knock on the doors and we kept people alive because they had a connection to people as well. Um, every day, and I'm, and I'm going to say it, we save a life every day. Yesterday, someone had had a stroke and no one had known and he was lying on his um, floor and we're the only ones that were going to knock on his door and we knocked on his door. So we found him. We give over 300 kids school lunches. Um, I'm going to say more than 300 kids school lunches. They are hungry. We've got hungry kids. We've got kids in our region, at schools in our region, that do not want to go on school holidays and do not want to go home at night because they're not going to eat. And you don't think that's happening in your town or your place of where you're living, but it is. It is happening. Um, especially now, the cost of living we're seeing people that would never have ever be caught dead in a place that was a charity. And they have to be with us now. Um, so that doesn't answer your question, but yeah, I, I live and breathe it. It's my heart and soul and I'm a better person. I'm a better mother and I'm still here. Yeah. But you should try moulding bread down and filling it with jam and deep frying <laughs> and then rolling it in sugar because it's amazing. It's not a question, of, it's, a, it's a question of admiration for what you're doing and also the food is delicious. Good. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. You're yeah. also just doing spectacularly delicious things. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah. There's a, there's, a, there's a chain of food that's coming through rescue that we can't really use for food relief. So if we're getting the prawns and the mussels with our food safety guidelines, our chefs need to do something with it. And so a lot of the other agencies that don't have kind of a catering arm or something like that, 
I don't know what they're doing with it. So when we're making that seafood stew, we're using the most incredible ingredients and we get so much blue cheese. We get so many beautiful cheeses come through. So we, appre yeah, like we appreciate the food and maybe because we're chef based, we know what it can do. Whereas if I sent blue cheese out to some of the suburbs here, they'd be like, she trying to kill me? I'm like, what the fuck is that? Um, so <laughs> we, we make sure that we target things to the right kind of streams of, of food rescue and waste because the waste is just, it's, kill, it's, it's killer. It's absolutely killer. Yeah. Stuart. Um, I know that we send a lot of our leftover product to you. Yeah. And we also ask because we're in such close vicinity, pretty much be sold in the shop and yeah. I'll take it down to the Torquay or the Geelong one and yeah. I'm happy for it to be sold there. In it going out to the rescue to the people in homes as we request from it, how well received is our crusty... Oh, it's, it's amazing. Is it, is it well received? Absolutely. Do they prefer... Oh, look. Look, what, well, what do you reckon? Yeah. <laughs> so, you're not going to get the appreciate, appreciation for it that you want because they don't understand it. Yeah. Um, and they probably never have had it before. But then there's some people that are just, do you, do you have any of that kept bacon? I can't afford it. I can't get there and I can't afford it. And they know it and they recognise it and they appreciate it. So there's absolutely appreciation see, for it. Yeah. I'm sure they all come with their own story. Yeah. Um, they're like, oh, oh. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, most of the kids, they want their white, mighty whites. That's, that's their, their I mean, diet. Our yeah. 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 Treat it as a, as a treat. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, we accept that. Yeah. I'm just hoping that it, it's still, like, the, the people, requiring food so much that they don't care what they get and they're, they're happy? Yeah, there's that as well. But um, we, we don't have... I can't get you that data as much because we don't put pressure on people yeah. to, to tell us anything. So it's only when they come to us and go, oh, my God, that sourdough bread did I, that you delivered last week, our drivers will probably be able to say, oh, you know, did, do you have that bread again? You know, that, it, makes, it makes such a difference to them. It... it so it, the food's sometimes about eating, but it's sometimes about joy, and it's yeah, it's about love. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody that's living really on the border of society yeah. um, gets proper food yeah. that has a story and there is actual yeah. you know, love into the product, right? yeah. like, for example, a baker's delight is just, you know... It's, yeah, it's shit. It would... <laughs> you know, I, I strongly believe that it would give um, people more of a hope in life. Yeah. Because I heard about the school in Newcom, which is also a suffering a lot. They, they've been requesting, and I, that's something that I've, do you work with the guys? Newcom. Newcom? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I've been, Jody is onto that, uh, that we get our leftovers bread for the children there. Because yeah. I've heard stories of children taking water bottles full of vodka with them yeah. because they thought that it was the water they needed to drink yeah. from my parents. Yeah. It's and it's just like three I don't want to, yeah, I can't, I don't even want to tell you what's happening. It's insane. Yeah. So at least that way, yeah. the leftovers go to... Yeah, it's amazing. To something. It's amazing. Rather than to pigs. Yeah. No, pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And everything that we can't use. So our wasted market's quite a, a big shop and it's got, you know, I think your plum jam that you've got here at the moment came from the plums that we had and um, anytime we've got extra, like extra bananas and stuff, kept bakers taking it and making amazing things with it. Um, what we have gone too far or we haven't been able to process, we fill a skip and we actually send it out to a farm with 50 rescue animals on it. So we've got zero waste of food unless we have to throw it out. If someone's, you know, if some businesses, some businesses use us as waste. Um, so if they've sent us a whole lot of fish that's turned, it's up to us to get rid of it. So um, some of that does have to get diverted into the wrong places, but 
pretty much everything is going to a human or an animal. Um, yeah, so, yes, Diane. Um, can I get you to cast your mind back to March 2020 through that Easter period? We experienced a lot of behavioural changes amongst the community uh, in regard to food. How did you guys fare? Oh, shit, it was hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, was, it was incredibly hard for us as a charity in our region. Um, our, my co-founder was the first one diagnosed with COVID. Um, and this, this, the panic that it caused was tremendous. Um, and there was a lot of aggression. I got absolutely abused for being outside yet I'm an essential service and I had to be outside and I was going to be outside. So um, we had to really get down to a skeleton crew of people with the same beliefs and um, passion and bravery to, um, to do the job that we were doing. But we were so welcomed at every place that we went to because we were putting ourselves in danger to provide for them. But um, yeah, it was tough. But it, it, it is the catalyst that turned us into just the hugest thing now that we are, um, because every other service closed their door. So um, we were just never going to close their door, and we still don't. We, we don't close any day of the year. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, so we actually offer them a large bag of fruit and veg, um, which can be stuff that they can cook with. We, we want them to be faced with having to do something, having some responsibility of eating the food that they get as well. So we'll supply the fruit and veg, also um, dry goods. So it's always gonna be a rice or a pasta or flour or something, um, as well as snacks for the kids and things like that. And then we offer five individual meals as if they're takeaway meals. So we'll do a chicken curry and a rice. So like for four people? Yep. For like for the household? So five meals a week? Yes. Yep. So we've never offered a service to cover you for everything. We've offered you a service to give you a break somewhere and give you a breath and give you a, a, a just a stop here. And if there's more than five of you, we'll give 10 meals. And if you request more, we'll give as many as you need for however long you need. So do you do that? Do the, so does like, say one household, have you been going to them for a whole year or do they? Two and a half years. So, so, like, so the whole time? They're still stuck. Yeah. So uh, do, like, how, is that a, like a process with these families? Yeah. Do you screen them or? We don't screen them. We get to know them. Um, when we're looking at 2,000 houses, and I have a waiting list of 180 in my inbox right now, we do what we can with the conversation between the drivers and the people that are living there. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. Some of, our, some of our volunteers and some people are like, you're just enablers. They're taking advantage then you get a message from someone who has been caring for their husband, has cancer for two years and their son's autistic, um, they can't leave the house, they've now injured themselves and their husband just died. Mm -hmm. So that two years of their life has been the worst two years of their life. Um, and then cancelled their service because she's now got a fixed leg and she can get in the car again and she's going to come to our market. So we try to step people out of delivery um, whether it's because they can't mentally bring themselves into a place. Um, there's a lot of that. It, it's loud and there's people. Um, people don't go to the shops because it's loud and there's people and they can't take it. Um, and so we step them out when they're ready to come and shop with us, which means they get some responsibility of choosing what they want. Um, and then hopefully they step out of it. So we work with some other services for some financial advice and um, some mental health advice. Um, but we will keep people on until we have real reason to, to know that it's, it's not needed. Um, but we just don't want to make any judgments because not everyone tells their truth. So, yeah. Hi. How can people or businesses best help you guys? Yep. 
So locally, we love donations of food or product. We'll always take whatever we possibly can. So when Buller calls me yesterday and says, we've got 10 pallets of um, choc tops from the cinemas, I said yes. And it's not because that's going to keep someone alive. It's because it's going to make that kid so fucking happy that I will put 10,000 of them out in the communities to see those kids smile. Um, and also so they don't throw it in the bin, because that's what's going to happen. Um, financial donations for businesses. We've got a corporate program where you can have $5 a week from you know, wages of staff to come support us. Um, we do a micro giving program. So if you do sign up for $5, it equates to five meals that can actually go out to the community. So there's a few businesses that do that. Um, and then also just really my most important thing is that more people know, the more people will talk about it and the more people can either tell someone that needs help or tell someone that's loaded <laughs> and goes, oh yeah, I'll support them. <laughs> so yeah, anything, anything at all is, is amazing for us. Yeah. Hi. Me? Yeah. Um, do you have any other quirky bread waste ideas? Oh, um, there's there's so many out there. So we we do so much bread and butter pudding. That's ridiculous. That's amazing. Um, rolling it down and using it as layers for like a bread lasagna, you can do that as well. Um, we lay it out and use it as a pizza base. So we're just replacing lots of that kind of flatbread thing or pasta with the bread. Um, when we first started, we actually took the waste from a local brewery and turned it into bread flour. And then we've been using, we were using the hops dried out and milled down and then sifted and using that to actually throw some protein into some of the baking that we're doing, which was really cool. Um, what else with bread? We, we don't make it into croutons and we don't make it into breadcrumbs because you've, I'd have to get a whole nother shed to store breadcrumbs and croutons. Um, we're deep frying it as well. Um, even in its own state, we'll just like roll something else up in it, like cheese and ham, slice off the edges, roll it up, deep fry it. Deep fryers make everything taste amazing. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot out there. Yeah. Is that it? Well, Can I go home? No. <laughs> well, let's hop back into MC mode. <laughs> um, Lana, just an incredibly powerful contribution to grains. Um, I wish I'd been able to eat the meals that you served everybody. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing the incredible work that you do. Really appreciate it. Yeah.